Trinitas Church, if you've spent any amount of time around Reformed folk, around Presbyterians, you've probably heard of the five points of Calvinism. And you're probably aware that these are some of the more controversial doctrines that Presbyterians believe. As a result, uh, you know, these, these are doctrines that go against the grain of what we want to believe in our own flesh. They highlight our own weaknesses, our own inabilities, and we are resistant to them when we encounter them in God's word. We're going to be talking about two of these doctrines today, the doctrines of total depravity and limited or definite atonement. But because these are doctrines which challenge us, doctrines which make us uncomfortable and even rebellious against what God's word says, we need to go to the Lord and ask him to give us strength and grace that we might respond appropriately to his word instead of in our own wisdom or in our own insights. So before we read the word, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray. And then when we do read, you'll want to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Let's ask the Lord to be with us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you invite us into your presence, not for anything that we have done, not because we have earned your favor or performed meritorious works, but because you have sent your one and only son to rescue us from our sins. Lord, we pray that as we hear your word this morning, that in areas where it might challenge our natural mode of thinking, we would be submissive to your word. That in areas where our sinful flesh wants to resist, you would break down barriers, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be amongst us, uh, speaking to us through your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read Galatians 4, 1 through 7. And after I finish uh, reading, we will stand and say, I'll say, this is God's word. You will say, thanks be to God. And then we will sing the Gloria Patri. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul says this, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters, if you grew up in the United States, uh, and more particularly if you, oh, I'm sorry, before I even get going, it is catechism today. Uh, So our four to six-year-olds are going to be dismissed uh, to go with Mr. Rath and with Ben Vanderhoff and their helpers. So if you have a four to six-year-old to send, they're going to go learn catechism, memorizing uh, the truths that we believe. As I was saying, if you grew up in the United States, or more particularly in, uh, you went to college in the United States that it's probably the case that at some point you were required to take a U.S. history survey course. Most colleges uh, set this out as no matter what your degree is, you got to know a little something about United States history, and so you're going to take a class. And if you went to a college to take this class, you probably wouldn't take the entirety of U.S. history in one course, but instead they divide it into two. I even went and looked this up at Northwest University, where uh, many of you are alumni, and it is, in fact, two courses for a survey of U.S. history. And the first course inevitably ends in 1877. Seems like an odd year to pick. Why 1877? The reason usually goes like this, that when the United States of America was founded, okay, from the earliest time that, that when we ratified the Constitution we endorsed as a country some form of slavery. And slavery continued in the United States until uh, the beginnings of the 1860s when we began to, uh, there was a civil war, aspects of which were over slavery. But really, 
uh, slavery didn't come to an end in the United States until the end of Reconstruction. And Reconstruction ended in 1877. And so essentially, United States history is divided between a period in which we had slavery and a period in which we didn't. And what Paul lays before us in the first few verses of Galatians 4 here is that your life is effectively characterized in the exact same way. Your life could be divided in half between a time in which you were enslaved to what Paul calls the elementary principles of the world and a time in which you were liberated from slavery by the work of Christ. Paul is going to lay out for us, in finishing his thought from chapter 3 and transitioning into what he will talk about in chapter 4, he will be moving from God's mighty works throughout the history of creation to God's mighty works in each and every one of our individual lives. <clears throat> he begins chapter 4 by finishing the thought from chapter 3. If you don't know this, our modern verses and chapter divisions did not exist when Paul wrote the scriptures. And so oftentimes we have arbitrarily decided where to uh, put a chapter break, right, for convenience sake. And verses 1 and 2 are really rephrasing the point that he made at the end of chapter 3, which is this, that a child under age, which the church in the Old Testament was, is under stewardship and management of the law of Moses, right? We saw that point last time uh, that we looked at Galatians, that in effect, a child can be likened, the church can be likened to a young child who inherits a great kingdom. He is the ruler of everyone in the land. He has the rights and authority over everyone in the land. And yet, no one would imagine that we should allow this young child to be making decisions about where this kingdom is going. He is neither capable nor competent to run the affairs of the kingdom. And as a result, stewards are appointed for the child to manage the affairs of the kingdom until he comes of age and can take the reins for himself. While he is under this stewardship, the child is in many ways similar to a slave. Just as the steward of the kingdom would not consult a slave about international politics or tax decisions, neither is he going to consult this young child who will one day rule the, the kingdom. And Paul, at the end of chapter 3 and in the beginning of chapter 4, says that this was true of us as the church, that under the old covenant, God had very strict regulations not the moral law, but the ceremonial law, which was in place in order to uh, guide and constrain the behavior of the church. And now that Christ has come, some of these restrictions have passed away. While the people of God were the heirs of all the promises found in the gospel, while they were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, just as we are, yet there were certain privileges which they did not yet have access to. They were still looking forward to Christ. Paul is finishing up that thought in verses 1 and 2, and it's an important thought for us just to remind ourselves of before we move on into the rest of what Paul is speaking of. Because we must never forget that while the church was under age in the Old Testament, it was still one church with us, looking forward to the blessings which have come more fully in Christ. But now Paul is going to transition to a new analogy. He is moving from the historical component of salvation, how God has worked out salvation for his people from great events like the Exodus and bringing his people into the promised land and the conquest of Canaan and then all the way to the sending of Christ. And now he's going to focus more on what this means in our own lives, what it means for us to be those who were once enslaved and are now set free the ancient world knew a thing or two about slavery. Unfortunately, our perspective on American slavery has often caused us to either downplay or fundamentally misunderstand slavery in the ancient world. If you were to go look up uh, Bible commentators talk about New Testament slavery, they will often paint the picture that this is basically a form of employment. When you see slave, you should just read employee. And while there is some rationale for that, the reality is that that is not an accurate picture of the slavery in which Paul saw on a daily basis. While slavery in ancient Rome was not race-based, it was in many ways a much more brutal system than anything that we had in the United States. 
Slaves in Rome were ubiquitous. There were slaves everywhere, slaves in all professions and places. If you think of the great name in Roman history, the very first name that probably comes to your mind is Julius Caesar. But Julius Caesar himself, as a young man, was captured by pirates and sold into slavery for a time. Slaves were everywhere. In Greece, in Asia Minor, the region to which Paul is writing in his epistle to the Galatians, slaves made up a quarter of the population. One in four people were enslaved. In the city of Rome, this number was even higher, where slaves made up a third of the population. Not only were slaves present everywhere, but they were also horribly mistreated. The life expectancy of a slave in ancient Rome was 17 years. At one point, slaves were so prevalent and food so hard to come by that it was more profitable to purchase a slave and work him until he died than to feed him. So when the ancient world spoke of slavery, they spoke of some of the most vile and inhumane practices which the human heart can soup to. I tell you this because we need to open our eyes to the realities of our own slavery. When Paul talks about us as being enslaved, we must not treat this as a light thing. We pride ourselves on our freedom as Americans, but as children of Adam, we are born slaves to our own sinful desires in ways that even when we have been freed from slavery by Jesus Christ, we often fail to comprehend. And I want to lay out a couple of things of what it means to be a slave and look at what it means for us to have been a slave to sin. First, the slave lacks his or her own will. The opinions and beliefs of the slave are not taken into account in decisions made by a master. The slave goes where he is told, works where he is told, eats what is set before him, and must generally submit to the will of another. If you are outside Christ, this is a description of you. Paul says that you are a slave to sin. This is captured in a doctrine that we refer to as total depravity. Your will, your desires are tainted and warped by your own sin. You will things that are contrary to the commands of God, and you find yourself unable to escape from desiring them. Just as a slave lacks the legal capacity to make their own choices, so humanity outside of Christ has lost the ability to make morally upright choices or choices that are honoring to God. The world is in slavery to sin in such a way that it cannot choose God. Their acts of virtue are tainted by sin. They are drawn to sin again and again, subjecting themselves to its lordship over them, even to their own harm and death. None of this, by the way, means that they're not making their own decisions. You see, one of the big differences between slavery in the ancient Roman Empire or in the United States and our own slavery to sin is that we have enslaved ourselves voluntarily. Our hearts and minds are so corrupted that we repeatedly choose the evil as if it were good. Many Christians have sought to downplay the realities of our slavery to sin because they believe that if we are really as captive to sin as I have just been describing, that we cannot be held accountable for it. But this is not the perspective of the scriptures. Scripture tells us that we are slaves incapable of doing what is right and simultaneously we are responsible and guilty for such a state. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, and indeed he cannot. Jeremiah tells us that we can no more give up our slavery to sin than a leopard could change his spots. And yet, we are guilty for having rejected the teaching of the Holy Spirit. So, as slaves, we have no will of our own, but another aspect of, of slavery is this, that the slave has no rights. A slave in ancient Rome was not considered to be a person. He could not own property. He could not enter into a court or, of law or, or legal contracts. The slave had no claim which his master was bound to recognize. And have you ever considered that this is true of you with respect to God? That your sin and open rebellion has enslaved you and you now have no claim on God's mercy and his grace. You see, I find that when I have conversations with people about 
the reality of hell and the reality of punishment for sin, uh, the, the objection that inevitably arises is that this is unfair. That for God to send people to hell would not be loving or just, but the reality is that we have no claim on God because of our rebellion against him. We deserve nothing from God. And how much greater would our appreciation for his kindness to us be if we thought more of this fact, if we contemplated more frequently that he owes us nothing? Not only does he owe us nothing, but we are positively deserving of his wrath. Many of those who were enslaved in ancient Rome would be those captured in war. Julius Caesar once captured uh, a city of 53,000 people in Gaul and sold them into slavery on the spot. But as awful as that is, consider what, from the perspective of the empire, these individuals deserved. The penalty for rebellion against the empire was death. Every moment this slave survived was a stay of execution, such is the case with us. Did we wake up this morning in our home? Did we have breakfast on our way to church? By the way, did we get here in our own car? Many of us went to Starbucks for breakfast. All of these things are far and away beyond what we deserve. If you're an unbeliever here today, I would say to you that the fact that God has not cast you into hell already is nothing but a stay of execution for what our sins deserve. Finally, consider that the slave has no resources. What can the slave bring to the table? Everything he has, even the shirt on his back, are the property of his master. The same is true of us. There's nothing that we can bring to the Lord which can alleviate our rebellion against him. The good things that we have are his. And by the way, those good things we aren't even using properly. We have rather taken his bounty and spent it on our own lusts our own sinful desires, and for our own rebellion against him. There's nothing we can do to break ourselves free from our slavery. John 3, 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus that if a man will enter the kingdom of God, he must be born again. And you contemplate how much of a say you had in being born the first time. It tells us a little bit about how much ability we have to be born again. Jesus says also that no one can come to Christ unless the Father will draw him. It is perhaps the worst aspect of our slavery that we have no resources to counteract it. Not only do we have no resources, but we accumulate our debt daily. Paul says in verse three that we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. This has been a phrase that has given considerable trouble to some commentators. In Colossians chapter three, he will use, sorry, Colossians chapter two, he will use the same phrase to refer to philosophical concepts which were drawn from paganism, and yet here he seems to be using the phrase to refer to the Old Testament works of the law. How can it be? We know that the law is holy, righteous, and good, and yet in some way it is creating a slavery. And here's what Paul is getting at he's saying, unbeliever, the unbeliever who comes to the law misunderstands it and uses it in a way similar to the way that pagans will use their own philosophies. Namely, that they think that they can behave in such a way as to earn favor from God. And Paul says that if we are using the law in this way, if we are using the law as a means of gaining life, then all we are doing is accumulating more and more of the debt which we owe. This is exactly, this is exactly the problem that Paul is fighting in, the, in Galatians. The Judaizers have come into the church and informed believers that they must use the law of God in order to free themselves from their slavery. But such a move is to completely disregard what the law was intended for and to make the Mosaic Code nothing more than a pagan philosophy. You see, the law separated from the grace of God who is the lawgiver is powerless to free us from our slavery. And so in using this, the law in this way, the Judaizers were digging themselves deeper and deeper into debt, actually increasing their sin, increasing what they owed to God. It's a bleak picture. Total depravity is not a cheerful doctrine. And Paul's exposition of it in just these couple of verses confronts us with a question, which is this, how can we be freed from 
from our own slavery. If we have lacked a will of our own, if we have no rights and we have no resources to deliver ourselves, how is it that we can be freed and restore ourselves to fellowship with God? If you asked an American how the United States brought slavery to an end, I Googled this, how did slavery end in America? And the answer is going to be the Emancipation Proclamation. This was a document issued by Abraham Lincoln in 1863 which declared that all those held as slaves in states of rebellion against the U.S. were now free. But do you know how many slaves were freed by the Emancipation Proclamation? The answer is zero. You see, Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation to free slaves in areas which he had no control over. It would be something akin to me saying that children who don't live in my house will eat broccoli for dinner every day. I don't actually have any authority over this, right? The tragedy is that many Christians today believe that something similar is exactly what happened in Jesus' death on the cross. That the death of Christ did not actually free anyone from their sins, it didn't actually save anybody, but it only opened up the possibility that at some point in the future, people would avail themselves of the right methods and therefore be saved. But this is decidedly not the perspective of the Apostle Paul. What Paul outlines for us in verses four through seven is the gospel's own emancipation proclamation. And it is a proclamation of a Trinitarian salvation that leaves nothing to chance. You see, if you were tempted to despair because of the doctrine of total depravity, Paul says, but there is an even greater doctrine and that is the salvation that is being offered that has been affected by the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is a salvation that leaves nothing to our own sinful hearts, but it is an effective rescue which will see us safely into heaven. The salvation can essentially be described as a twofold sending. Note the parallels between verses four and verses six. In verse four, Paul says that God sent forth his son. And in verse six, he says that he spent, sent forth the spirit of his son. These two persons of the Trinity have entered into time and history to accomplish salvation for the people of God. So what are these two sendings? The first is the sending and the work of the Son. Thus far in Galatians, Paul has had a lot to say about how we as believers come to benefit from the work of Christ. Time and time again, he has spoken of the fact that we encounter the work of Christ. We receive the benefits of the work of Christ by faith. But until this moment, he has not fully unpacked what that work of Christ was. And he's going to do that here. When he tells us, first of all, that you know, he tells us that Christ did three things for us. First, that Christ was born of a woman. The sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden made it necessary that humanity itself pay the penalty for the crimes which they had committed. One of the reasons an Israelite in the Old Testament would have always known that the sacrificial system they lived under could not be the final word from God is because, as Hebrews tells us, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. As it was our own flesh which had engaged in sin, so it must be our own humanity which offers up a sacrifice on our behalf to bear the penalty for this sin. The Saint Anselm captured this well in wrestling with the question of why God became man and he uh, came to the conclusion that we have held to ever since that God had to become man because as it was man who sinned, it was man that owed the debt. And Paul says that that is exactly what Jesus Christ did when he was sent. He was born of a woman, meaning that he took on your flesh. This is an affirmation of the complete and real humanity of Christ. Christ is uniquely qualified to be your mediator because he lives eternally not only as God, which he never ceased to be nor will ever cease to be, but also as man. And as a man, he knows you. He knows the temptations that you face as he himself was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. But as majestic as Christ becoming man for us is, as profound as it is, Christ did more than this. You see, we all have a tendency in our pain and our suffering to want someone to empathize with us. Is where we derive the famous saying, misery loves company. 
But at the same time, we all understand that such a friend who can commiserate with us is insufficient to be a savior. Imagine for a moment that you were trapped in an elevator during a fire. And you can hear the firefighters outside the building and you're waiting patiently for them. And finally, the doors of the elevator slide open and there's a firefighter and he's found you. And he slips inside the elevator and he closes the doors again. And he starts looking at you and he says, yeah, it is hot in here. You're right. This is a pretty tough situation, right? All of us, this is, this is comical because there's no way that a firefighter would behave this way. And yet, if you were to follow liberal Christianity, they have reduced Christ to such an activity. He comes to empathize with us, but he bears no solution along with us. Once again, this is not Paul's Christ. Paul says that when Christ took on flesh, he was born under the law. He knew the yoke under which you labored, but he knew it not simply so that he could commiserate with you about it, not simply so that he could be crushed with you under the weight of your failures, but that he might rather lift this burden off of you and redeem you from its curse. Paul gives you the purpose of Christ coming in verse five. Notice what it doesn't say. Oftentimes when we read scripture, this is a good way of reflecting on what scripture means. It's by reflecting on what it doesn't say. Paul doesn't say that Christ came in order to make it possible for you to be redeemed by the law if you'll only do your part. No, Christ is no half savior. Instead, Paul says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. This would have been very familiar language to anyone shaped by the Old Testament. Consider particularly Leviticus chapter 25. God is giving the law to the Israelites. And he says, I can imagine a scenario happening like this, right? There's a scenario where a man uh, gets himself into a situation where he's financially unable to pay his debts. And so God sets up a, a situation in which that individual could essentially sell themselves into indentured servitude, into some form of slavery. But that slavery was not to be a permanent slavery, Rather, at any point in time, a relative or a friend could come and could redeem that person from their slavery by paying off their debts. And Paul says that this is exactly what Christ has done for you. We were debtors to God. We were debtors from the moment of when we were conceived, when we owed him a perfect obedience. And for every transgression which we have committed against the law, we have accumulated our debt but Paul says that Christ came and he paid both. He obeyed perfectly and he died in our place. And in this way, he redeemed us. He purchased us for God. And just as it would be unjust for any Israelite to remain trapped in slavery after someone had paid their redemption price, so also it would be unjust for God to demand of you payment, which Christ has already given this concept is captured in a hymn written by Augustus Toplady, From Whence is Fear and Unbelief, when he writes, If thou hast my discharge procured, and freely in my room endured the whole of wrath divine, payment God cannot twice demand, first at my bleeding surety, surety's hand, and then again at mine. Once, before you came to Christ, you were confronted by the law of God and his righteousness, and it was God's solemn duty as holy and righteous to condemn you. But now because Christ has redeemed you, the opposite has become the case. The righteousness and holiness of God must secure your salvation. The idea of Christ ransoming us is fundamental to our belief in the atonement. More than that, it is why we as Presbyterians believe in what has been referred to as a limited atonement. I don't think that's a very helpful phrase. A better phrase is a definite atonement because you see the one who limits the atonement is the one who claims that Christ died for all men but has not actually saved anyone. With the best of intentions, there are those who would argue that while Christ died for all of humanity, it was not sufficient to save a single one of them. And I would submit to you that this is the real limited atonement. By contrast, we confess and believe that Christ died for the elect and that he will save without fail each and every person for whom he died. And there are a lot of biblical arguments for this doctrine, but if you wanted to know in a single word why we believe and why we teach definite atonement, it is this word, 
redeemed. To be redeemed is to be bought with a price. If I somehow had the ability to contact your bank and to pay off your mortgage, it would be criminal to the utmost for your bank to continue to expect payment from you month by month. If your debt has been paid in full, and believer in Jesus Christ, this is exactly what he has done for you, then he has fully paid your debt and nothing more can be expected from you. If Christ has purchased someone, then that person will spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. The very character of God is on the line for them. But the death of Christ is not the end of his story. He also rose from the dead. Sometimes we get so caught up in defending the historicity of the resurrection, which we affirm with all of our hearts, that we often forget that the resurrection has theological significance for us. Jesus' resurrection is absolutely necessary because it is a divine declaration that his work for you has been accepted by God. Paul says in Romans that Christ was raised for our justification. When God brought Jesus forth from the dead, it was a renewal of that declaration he made in Christ's baptism that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You could say that the resurrection is God proclaiming this is my beloved son and his offering is well pleasing to me. Christ is not only raised from the dead, he also ascended to the father's right hand to receive a reward for his labors. Did you know that Christ has received a reward for the work that he did on the cross? The prophet Isaiah said that the suffering servant would see the travail of his soul and would be satisfied. The New Testament tells us that when Christ ascended on high, the reward for his work was the pouring out of the spirit into your hearts. Pause and think for a moment about that. Christ's love for you is so profound that having done all the Father required of him, he sought no better reward than the right to give you the Holy Spirit. Now, we believe the Spirit was active in redeeming people in the Old Testament, but even so, there is a sense in which the fullness of the Spirit was not poured out until after Christ had ascended into heaven. Jesus knew that the pouring out of the Spirit was the reward for which he would ascend into heaven when he declared to his disciples on the night before his death that it was to his advantage that he went away because if he did not go away, the helper would not come to them. But since he went to the cross and since he has risen from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the father, therefore he is able to pour forth the spirit on his people as the just reward for his work. And who is this spirit poured out on our hearts? First and foremost, he is the spirit of God's son. He is the spirit with whom the son had fellowship from all eternity. And this spirit equal God with the son and enjoyed an unimaginable bliss from all of eternity is sent to dwell also with you. We talk a lot about what a display of love it is for the son to, play, to take our place on the cross. What a remarkable amount of love it is that the father would give away his son and all that is true. But it should be no less remarkable to us to consider that the Father and the Son have also loved us enough to share the great joy of fellowship with the Spirit, with us. He has poured out into our hearts, making us a dwelling place of the living God. The Son and the Spirit were sent not so that you might be redeemed and left at a distance, but that you might be brought into the eternal loving fellowship of the Holy and Blessed Trinity. C.S. Lewis was right when he bemoaned our inability to fathom the true weight of this glory. I believe the more we meditate upon this, the more that this truth is brought home to our hearts and our minds, the less appealing will be the sin which clings to us so easily. Young people, listen to me for a moment. When you're young, the entire world seems to be laid out before you. It seems that you can do anything Whatever your hopes and dreams are, whatever you aspire to, those options are still open to you. And in many ways, that is true. But I promise you that there is nothing you can aspire to in this life that would even come close in comparing with the wonder, joy, and fulfillment that will come from knowing fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wherever you go in this life, whatever you do, seek this first. First. 
because there is no higher price. So what does the Spirit do when he's poured out into our hearts? He cries out, Abba, Father. Many philosophies and religions profess the universal fatherhood of God, but this is simply not true. While God is the creator of all and in some sense can be called Father in that way, the reality is that the unconverted sinner is not the child of God in fellowship with God. Instead, Paul says in Ephesians 2 that he is rather a child of wrath. And Jesus tells the Pharisees that they are of their father, the devil. Being a child of God is not a universal human experience in this sinful world, but rather a privilege granted to us in Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters of God because he is the son and because what he is, of what he has done on our behalf. And just consider for a moment that every time you pray the Lord's Prayer, you are actually making a profession of Christ's victory. If the death and resurrection of Christ and his ascension to the right hand of the Father is necessary for us to be adopted into the family of God, then your prayer, our Father, is a profession that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. To call God your Father is at the same moment to confess that there is one in heaven who bears your humanity and whose work on your behalf has been successful. It is the Spirit of God who enables us to lift up this cry. And in fact, Paul says here that it is the Spirit himself who makes this cry for us. The Almighty God is so intent on you knowing that you are his child that he himself has come to speak the cries of adoption for you. Note again the definite reality of what Paul is affirming. Because of the success of the work of Christ, God has sent forth his Spirit into our hearts. There are no spiritless Christians There's no class of super Christians who have the spirit while others don't, but rather to be adopted into the family of God is to have the spirit of God dwelling in you. Everything that we've said here this morning is not simply an exercise in intellectualism. We're not here simply to gain knowledge. These truths have profound importance for how you are to live. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, Paul combines the presence of the Spirit within us and the price paid by the Son for us to command the Corinthians that they glorify God in their bodies. Christ has not set us free from our slavery in order that we might indulge in the desires of the flesh, but that we would be holy, blameless, and undefiled. What you do with your body matters because it is the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. What you say matters because you are not your own, but you have been bought by the blood of the Son of God. What you think matters because you call upon God as your Father and he has summoned you to be holy as he is holy. The truths that we have expounded here this morning are not to evaporate into the air, but are to fuel righteousness and holy living according to all God's commandments. Trinitas Church, put off covetousness because you have been bought with a price and the Spirit of God dwells within you. Cease lying, speak the truth to one another because you have been bought with a price and the spirit of God dwells within you. Do not steal from one another, put off all sexual immorality, do not kill and devour one another because you have been bought with a price and the spirit of God dwells within you. Honor those in authority, rest on God's holy day and revere his name because you have been bought with a price and the spirit of God dwells within you. And finally, brothers and sisters, worship this God. And him only, because you have been bought with the blood of his own son, and you are the temple of his spirit. If you're an unbeliever here today, there is only one means of being freed from your slavery to sin, and that is Jesus Christ. I invite you to believe on him, to put your trust in him. You can come talk to me or one of the elders after the service if you have questions about these things. A believer in Christ, go away from here with great joy that there is one sitting at the Father's right hand whose salvation for you has been effective and he will carry it on to completion. Let's pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are not a God of half measures. We thank you that you are not a God who came halfway and left the rest up to us, but that you Lord, have rescued us. You have ransomed us and redeemed us. Lord, we pray that as we
give of our tithes and offerings and as we come to celebrate at your table, that it would be a celebration of the completed work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Lord, if there are any here who don't know you, we pray that your spirit would effectively draw them, that they might come to know and put their faith in you, that they might rejoice and be numbered among your people. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.